Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. A little less than two weeks ago, the 2021 season of the NFL came to a close as the Los Angeles Rams won the Super Bowl. And I don't much care about who won the Super Bowl, but I mentioned that to you to just tell you that just because that happened doesn't mean I'm done talking about sports. Today, I'd like to do a Forever Friend segment, and as a lead-up to it, I want to tell you a little bit about what it's like to be a Steeler fan. Steeler Nation is that uh, community of people who are zealous and committed to the success of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And the truth uh, is, the reason it's called Steeler Nation is because we are everywhere. Let me encourage you sometime uh, that, that today when you are driving home from somewhere, just keep your eyes out, uh, open, and, and you will see, if, unless you live like one door down from where you work, you will almost certainly see a Pittsburgh Steeler fan during your commute. Uh, you can see it in the, the little uh, uh license plate holder in the back of the car. You see a sticker on the back windshield. You'll see it on uh, the gear at the grocery store, people wearing jerseys and things of that nature. We're everywhere. And we encourage each other. We uh, talk to each other when we sort of connect with each other. I live in Indiana, and yet I I, I see him all the time, and I talk to him. Uh, But there's a... kind of a, uh, what's the word for it? I don't know. There's two layers of connection. You have the connection of the love of the Steelers, but then you wonder, is this person from Pittsburgh? Is this person from the area? And that makes it even more sweet. And one way you can tell is by the accent. All of which brings me to a forever friend that I want to give thanks for. His name is Chuck Maselli. And I never knew Chuck in Western Pennsylvania. I knew Chuck in Central Florida. Uh, Chuck is still, as far as I know, still in Central Florida. Chuck married uh, another friend who uh, worked for many years for Ligonier Ministries. And uh, the two of them got married and uh, lived in a house not far from where my house was. And uh, I, they, they came and attended a, a weekly Bible study that we taught. Um, and it was just such a pleasure to have a fellow Yinzer nearby. Now, Chuck has more going for him than I don't want to say just being from Pittsburgh, like it's a small thing. It is a great thing. Uh, Chuck had the uh, accent, has the accent. Chuck, uh, you know, was familiar with the landmarks and the the ethos. And, you know, we could talk the talk. We could talk Pittsburgh to each other. But that's the gist of uh, the broader reason why he was such a gift as a friend. You could talk to Chuck about anything. It didn't surprise me at all when during our uh, friendship, he stopped doing what he was doing in order to uh, secure a master's in social work. And he worked as a kind of uh, chaplain in hospitals, ministering to people, very gentle, quiet spirit. He wasn't gushy and soft, but he was soft-spoken and gentle. Uh, And I got to know him. This is uh, maybe some good counsel for you, especially maybe as we are coming out of the age of COVID. I got to know Chuck because uh, he was a part of a group of friends that met once a week uh, for breakfast. 
uh, we met at a particular restaurant as long as we could. And there were mm, five of us, maybe. And we had no agenda. We had no Bibles. Not that Bibles are bad things. Of course, Bibles are wonderful things. But this was uh, the purpose of this get together was to just get together and be friends. You may have heard me tell the story about a so, sort of a little routine I do talking about programs and how bad programs are. And I tell a story of walking into my church one Sunday and this young man seemed very kind of eager standing at the front door, uh, asking everyone, including me as I went in, if I was part of an accountability group, do you have an accountability group? And I looked at him and I didn't quite understand why he was asking me this. And I thought maybe I would try to help him. And I said, well, I have friends. Is that what you mean? Something much more organic about that. And that's what Chuck was like. Chuck was a friend. Chuck was the kind of friend who wouldn't tell you, wouldn't be afraid to tell you if he thought you were uh, getting out of line or, or behaving badly. And he would do it again, straightforwardly and gently. He just had a knack for that kind of conversation, not making you feel like you're under a spotlight, not making you feel like you're being accused, uh, and like you're being helped. And so, so here's a friend who is both fun, uh, and useful. Chuck and I actually, uh, canoed together down the Oklawaha, uh, river there in central Florida. I think it's the Oklawaha. And, uh, <laughs> oh gosh, uh, this is a river with uh, alligators uh, in regular view along the sides. And we, I, I was in the back supposed to, to steer and I steered us into a tree uh, that was leaning over the river and we fell out of the canoe and had to get back in while there's alligators all around. So we had, we had quite an adventure together as well. I haven't talked to Chuck in a long time, but I'm pretty sure I'll be able to get this to him. I just want to thank him. I want to thank our, li our living God for uh, providing the friendship that we had for those years that we had it. Uh, he's a good man. He's got a good wife. They've got some wonderful children. Uh, Chuck, you are, uh, someone that I think of and give thanks for, and I miss you. There's a new division in town and we're talking about my generation with the rise of sociology, demographics, and marketing. We find the world is finding new ways to divide us, sift us, to put us where we belong, which means in turn that the church is doing much the same. Add to the mix, the potent brew of victimology, and we are off to the races. I was born in 1965. On more than one occasion, I have seen statistics that suggest that the baby boom ended in 1964, and others suggesting that Gen X begins in 1966. <laughs> which I suppose makes me and others born in 1965, the generationless generation. We don't know who we are or where we belong. We can set the clock on a VCR, but don't know how to do a hard drive refresh. Which may explain why none of this makes any sense to me. What, for instance, does being young have to do with being reformed? What does my birthday have to do with my understanding of the biblical role of the state? What is the difference between being missional and being obedient? And ultimately, isn't the Bible 
the church, the means of grace, aren't these for all of us? Now, I'm not suggesting that there might not be similarities in outlook among some who were born in the same decade. I'm not arguing against the notion that this group might have this weakness and that group might tend toward that strength. What I am suggesting is that it doesn't matter a lick. Not a lick. My calling before God transcends my generation or lack thereof. My need from God is the same as those who were born before me and as those who were born after me. My parents need every day to repent and believe the gospel. My children need every day to repent and believe the gospel. Skinny jeans and wool caps have nothing to do with it. Pride and selfishness are driven by living for self, by a me perspective, by demanding attention in bulk. We haven't moved to a you perspective, but a we perspective. That is, we're being selfish together which is still altogether selfish. What about us and our needs is no great improvement over what about me and my needs. Wrestling for my generation's megaphone to speak for my people is still wrestling for a megaphone, and worse, it misses who my people are. My people are old people, not the greatest generation. They are aging people, not boomers. They are young people, not millennials. And as many as are afar off. What I need is to learn to recognize my family. What I need to learn is that what defines me is the same thing that defines every other Christian, whatever their age. The blood of Christ that washes us. The Spirit of Christ who indwells us. The Kingdom of Christ that welcomes us. We have been given a transcendent gospel that not only crosses barriers, but breaks them down. The gospel makes of the many one. We're no longer defined by what we buy, but by the one who bought us. May he give us the grace to toss overboard our generational markers. And may we recognize each other the same way those outside are to recognize us by our love one for another. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.